what I'm going to get into here is a little bit of, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, speaking about prefabricated modular data centers. Uh, I've spoken on this topic a few times. If you've seen my presentation, some of it will be the same, but uh, this, this has new info, um, some prelimi preliminary findings from our, <clears throat> excuse me, from our, uh, the, our research on the economics of Data Center 2.0, as we call it, the, the modular, modular prefab as well. Um, this is sort of a, a short agenda of what I'm going to cover uh, as I speak here. The first thing we need to do is talk about the, the pain points of the data centers, what problems we're solving. <clears throat> we'll look at where we are today. Uh, we'll do a little bit of market segmentation and definition um, and, and really talk about the concept of industrializing the data center. Some key considerations to, to take into account when, when looking at the economics of, of data center 2.0 and really just parsing the market in general. And then finally, we'll go into some preliminary findings of, of our economics research and, and talk about some of the other uh, in-depth research that we're doing. Um, so Jack did, did a good intro on that, but one, one of the problems with, with most of the examples that he gave is that, I'm going to put it bluntly, they're ugly. Um, data centers are expensive. You know, in the past, they were very time intensive, uh, capital intensive. And you've got people involved in, in the decision process. And there's a, there's a, a feeling of uh, necessity to leave a legacy, to, to leave a mark, you know, make it yours. Because when you're spending that amount of time and that amount of money on something, you want to differentiate not just as a company, but also as someone who's managing that process. So whereas a lot of those prepackaged units, um, you know, it's not a new concept, bringing it into the white space has been a very, very slow process. Schneider Electric, um, I don't know if they were the first, uh, first to come up with the concept of, of prefabrication and modularity in the data center, but uh, Neil Rasmussen will tell you that they were. Um, he'll, he'll tell you a lot of things, actually. Um, but as is the case with, with, uh, with Neil in, in general and kind of their innovation, they were kind of before their time. I don't remember what it was called. I think some pod or something, uh, but anyway, We've come back to it, and, uh, and I'll talk about why now is different than before uh, in, in a few slides here. So before we get into um, talking about you know, modularity and all of that, we need to take a step back and think about the decision process. Right? If you're an organization, you shouldn't just immediately jump to, am I doing prefab or am I doing bricks and mortar? There's a whole decision tree before that. You, know, you need to think about your business need, uh, do you need, <clears throat> excuse me, do you need more IT service? You know, a number of different options there. You can look to the cloud, some SaaS models, repurposing, uh, decommissioning servers, um, refreshing, virtualizing environments. Then you move into, okay, well, we're beyond the point of, of needing more IT service. We now need more IT gear. Uh, then you, uh, you can look at co-location. You can retire obsolete and reclaim that capacity. Uh, and you can also put it in your existing data center. Do we need more data center? And then we, we talk about do we need to build new, expand existing, or buy? And then finally, if you build new and expand existing, then we get into the decision process of debating uh, bricks and mortar versus um, data center 2.0 or prefabricated modular. And I just want to say, uh, I agree with what Jack was saying. I want to make this very interactive. So if, if, if as I'm speaking, you have any, uh, if you have any comments or, or like to challenge me on any points or clarify any points, please. Uh, don't don't be bashful. Um, I mean, you can save your questions to the end, but it might be helpful for everyone if we just had it in context as well. I like to keep it loose. So once we get past that uh, that decision tree, um, these are the four main pain points of, of data center expansion as as we see them. Um, we have financial speed, reliability, and efficiency. Financial being uh, the the first and foremost. Um, some would argue that reliability is, uh, is, is the, top, uh, the top pain point. But really, when we talk about reliability, we're talking about cost, uh, cost avoidance, right? Because if your data center goes down, you lose revenue. Uh, so really, it is a financial, uh, a financial consideration. Secondly, speed, speed to market. The sooner you can bring your data center capacity to market, the sooner you can start generating revenue from whatever uh, service or application is running within that data center. Again, it's sort of an extension of the financial aspect um, but uh, it, it, it is the second one. Thirdly, I mentioned reliabi reliability. Uh, we want to make sure that um, 
know, that we don't sacrifice reliability when we're, uh, when we're talking about new builds, expansions, and what have you. And then finally, similarly, efficiency. Uh, we want to keep pushing the envelope on making sure data centers operate uh, more efficiently, make best use of, of the power that we have and the cooling that we have, again, to optimize uh, data center uh, usage. So taking a look at where we are today, I really like this graph. This is from, um, this is from, from our sister uh, company, ChangeWave Research. It's a, uh, it is a survey that they've done of, uh, of, of their very, very large network of, um, of respondents. And the question is, what do they project their IT spending for the next quarter to be? And this goes all the way back through 2002. Um, and, and there are a few different data points to it, but the two, main import, the two, the two important ones for this one are, do they expect to have decreased uh, or no IT spending or an increase in IT spending? And the, the reason that this is applicable here is, by extension, um, it sort of is, is an indicator of what data center growth will be. Because if there's increase in IT spending, uh, it is, it is a either purchase of new IT gear or a refresh of old, old IT gear, and uh, it's generally you know, pushing data center capacity utilization forward. So you can look at this as uh, data center growth. Um, in, in terms of CapEx spending for the data center, right? So if you look, I don't have a laser pointer, but I don't think. Do I? No, anyway, you get the idea. Um, so if you look at uh, through, say, um, November 2002 through November 2007, you see just spending, 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 <coughs> increased spending for, for a long, long time. Big, uh, big growth of, of data center. Then, of course, we have the downturn. We, we need to pull back the reins, um, spend less, fewer spending more. And then this interesting di dynamic here at the end is, is the, most, uh, the most telling for me. We have this flip-flopping back and forth. We have spend more, spend less, spend more, spend less. Uh, and I expect to see this uh, continue. Because what I think happened is there was a revelation that, look, we just can't willy-nilly spend a whole bunch of money on our data center. We need to do it practically. We need to do it. Um, you know, with, with some semblance, of some, some type of plan, and not just, you know, build and, and, uh, and worry about the revenues after. So what this has done is it has is, is sort of created a perfect storm in the data center industry for helping push prefabrication and modularity, and really what, what I'm talking about is standardization um, forward. And, and I think that we're going to continue seeing that. <laughs> So I've got two slides here that give our formal definition of data center 2.0. There, uh, there are a lot of different terms out there, modular data centers, prefab data centers, um, phased builds, that kind of thing. And everyone is, is saying that, that they're modular in some way, shape, or form. Uh, it is as confusing, if not more so, than cloud and uh, increasingly big data. Um, but you know, we, we first want to put the stake in the ground and explain what we see as a definition. So, um, the, the key things here, and I'm not going to read it to insult your intelligence, but uh, it, it's comprehensive, uh, off the shelf, and uh, just all of the work is pre-done, right? And it's delivered to wherever the customer is in pieces. Uh, and they can, be, they can then be put together more cheaply, more quickly uh, than, uh, than you would find during normal construction methods. What's included? At the very least, we have IT space, power, cooling, and UPSs, backup generation. And the most important point here for Data Center 2.0, and I'll get into further segmentation in a bit, is that each individual piece of that is individually scalable. So if you look at the containerized data centers, they're all mixed assets. They're all everything together. You can get an optimized environment, yes, but the problem is that you can't individually scale each part of those. So you have to be very careful with your, uh, with your deployment of IT within those containerized data centers, and this doesn't work for a lot of folks. So that was one of the problems with, with the initial adoption of containerized data centers and why they were such uh, an abysmal failure. The, um, you know, most of the ones that, that came out initially from the server manufacturers, they, they were the ones that thought, uh, look, you know, this is great. I can package 3,000 servers together, and we can sell a bunch of just a bigger, bigger box of, of IT. Problem was, again, going back to the thing, it was ugly. It was hard to maintain. Uh, and you couldn't individually uh, scale into, uh, different components of it. 
And then it may include ancillary systems uh, like I have there. This sort of breaks up uh, how we, we segment prefabricated and, and, and the, the industrialization of the data center. Uh, in, in the top left, we have IT modules, or rather on, on, on the left as a whole, we have the modules, and on the right, we have containers, right? ISO containers, non-ISO modules. Um, then you have your IT modules on the top left, power cooling modules on the bottom left, and then when you bring those two together, then we have what we call your integrated modular data center where it brings the different modules together in a, in a cohesive package. Not, not in a singular package, but uh, you know, a, a project in and of itself that includes both pieces of that. And then on the right, you have IT containers, and then power cooling containers, and then in the middle, you have your uh, containerized data center, which is one, you know, the, the ice cube or the black box, uh, um, and what have you. And then in the bottom right, there still is a, a place for traditional data centers. You know, it's very important to maintain the look and feel and maintainability of the white space that everyone is familiar with. Uh, so what we'll see is we will see traditional data center interior and supplementation with some type of, uh, of, of power cooling. Um, you supplement it with either ISO containerized power cooling modules, uh, or sorry, power cooling containers, or non-ISO power cooling modules. So this is sort of a, a different way to look at it. Um, I won't dwell on this uh, too terribly long here. Um, but what you have is, you know, you start from the traditional data center, go down to the, the holy grail data center 2.0, and then uh, from, from left to right, you have, you know, the different components that you saw on the previous slide, prefab IT, power cooling, ISO container, and then finally the, the aspect of individually scalable power cooling and IT. Um, so if you see the traditional data center, you can have prefab IT and everything is individually scalable, but as you go down, you're missing certain pieces of it, and then finally with data center 2.0, you basically have all of the advantages, and the ISO may or may not be a part of it. Um, the ISO container is, in, in, I like to use the analogy that it's, it's a debate of paper versus plastic. Um, it almost doesn't matter, so long as you have the other, the, the other, um, the other aspects of data center 2.0. Um, and then of course, if, if you're a customer and you, you know, especially if you're a co-location provider and you're, you're dealing with um, smaller customers that are more regionalized or or local or whatever, then they are more concerned about a certain user experience, if you will, within the data center. You know, they're not okay going into a, uh, a, a very cramped um, ISO container so long as there's still the server hugger mentality. And, uh, and we've said for a while that, um, that it's, you know, may, may be going the way of the dodo, but uh, it still, it prevails. Um, I think we're getting into a new generation of, of of people, of operators, of talent that are okay with detethering from that. You have, uh, you have folks, you know, putting all their media um, on, on, you know, Flickr or Picasa or whatever, and you know, remote admin of their home machines or whatever. Um, so it's gonna, it, it will eventually happen that we don't care so much about being in the data center, but, uh, but we've we've got a long way to go. So this is a very ugly uh, illustration of of what I just talked about. Um, I don't profess to be an artist, so please excuse the, uh, the jagged edges. But um, the first slide is where we have a traditional bricks and mortar space that's, uh, that, that's shown by the double line. And then of course you have the, the pink is, is if there's any prefab modular space, green IT equipment, yellow power, power uh, equipment, and blue is cooling equipment. In the left we have your traditional approach everyone is familiar with. Uh, in the center we have uh, a hybrid design, bricks and mortar, with, uh, with prefab power and cooling. So this is how it would look. Um, you have pre or, uh, sorry, modular cooling, modular power, and then all your IT uh, in, in the center there. This is what I was talking about in the bottom, the bottom right of that, uh, that Venn diagram that I showed before. And then, uh, and then finally on the right, you have, um, you have an existing uh, data center that already had your uh, prefab, uh, I'm sorry, you, all your, already had your power and cooling and it's supplemented with prefab uh, modules to add capacity. So it's essentially a combination of, the, of, uh, of number one and number two to get, uh, to get number three. So these are, um, the, the second and the third are things that we'll see, I think, more and more of. 
And then here we have, we eliminate the bricks and mortar space. You'll see no double lines around any of this. Um, the first one we have here is your, your containerized data center. We have everything together. Uh, the second one is you have containerized cooling, containerized power, containerized IT, all in ISO put together as, uh, as your, your data center. Um, then you have a non-ISO iteration of what you have on the left, uh, everything mixed together. And then finally, you have your um, combination of all of it, um, again, with, without, excuse me, without ISO. So the segmentation is, is complex. Um, we, we, tr we try and make it as simple as possible, uh, but there are a lot of different vendors out there. Uh, even in the past year, the number of vendors has exploded um, on the prefab and modular data center front. Um, and it's just, it, it's been ridiculous to keep up with, but it means that, uh, that, that the market is healthy. Uh, so these are just some of, um, some, some examples uh, right now, and even within the past week, um, I'm missing some. This is a snapshot of, uh, just as an aside, this is a snapshot of um, most of the folks that we uh, included in our outreach on, uh, on market sizing. We're, we're doing research on the market size of uh, prefabricated and modular. In our previous report, we estimated that uh, the 2011 was around 240 million of modular data centers that wasn't including the containerized, um, you know, singular uh, ISO container. Um, it's looking like, and don't quote me on this right now because we're still in the final stages of it, but it's looking like including uh, containerized data centers. Um, so really pre all of the prefab market to include modular components um, as well as, uh, as data centers and containerized, uh, containerized components. It's looking at close to half a billion, somewhere around there. Um, but again, that report is due to come out within the next month. So um, if it's something that you're interested in, let me know. So what are the, going back to the pain points um, th that I said initially, what are the implications on these pain points when you take Data Center 2.0 into account? Uh, these were initial projections, and, and I'll get into some more refined uh, findings here uh, in a slide or two. But financially, we're talking about equal to 20% less. Um, this is both OPEX and CAPEX uh, together, so TCO. But there, there are tangible savings on the CAPEX side, which is what most folks uh, are concerned with. Um, for speed, we're looking at less than six months, two to four or less is the goal, and there are some that are, uh, that are, that are claiming you know, very, very short runways of weeks, um, like six weeks or so. I haven't yet seen, uh, seen, seen a real-world example of that, but these are the claims that, have been, that are being made. Reliability and, and efficiency. Um, Maintaining or improving reliability, but the interesting thing about Data Center 2.0 and prefabrication is that you can start to mix your environments and tailor your IT environment, or rather, you can tailor your, your support infrastructure to your IT environment more easily. Uh, in a scenario where you have a data center, and if you were to say, you know, you have one, this one area of very high density, you have another area of, um, of say, uh, uh, of in-rack cooling, and you have an, one area that's, tier, quote, tier three, uh, and another that's tier four, you have four, essentially have four different engineering projects, because um, you have to make sure that you meet the needs of all of those. To the extent that each of those is prepackaged and off-the-shelf orderable, um, you, can, you can avoid a lot of that cost and, and time associated with it. So it's not, it's not so much four different construction projects, it's four installations and startups. So you start to, on the reliability front, as well as efficiency, you start to um, uh, get into areas where you can tweak your environment uh, a little more um, granularly than, than you could in the past. And then finally, efficiency, uh, at least 15% improvement. And I think most of that will be seen through uh, autonomy and intelligence. Uh, this, is, this is an area that a lot of people gloss over. And I think that the biggest advantage, in my mind, of prefabrication and modularity is that of standardization because you have you know, a standardized approach. If I were to tell people right now that I could install monitoring controls and everything into your data center at no cost, I don't think anybody would, would object to that. Assuming, of course, it's a new build and I'm, I'm not disrupting uh, existing 
uh, existing applications. The problem is that this is, there's a significant cost to this, um, to this undertaking, and the reason is because every single one of them is a, new, uh, is a new project. You have to know what the monitoring points are, you have to coordinate between the different vendors, the, the uh, controls monitoring and automation guy is always the last one in, it's, he's always the one being rushed, and uh, always the one to, to, that's on the hook for, for solving all the problems that are happening, um, and most times they're not really uh, his fault. When you standardize your platform, you can build into it because you have a standardized platform. You can build the, the monitoring controls and automation uh, into it and amortize the costs of putting that in over the product lifetime. So I think that is where we're going to see a lot of, uh, a lot of action and, and a lot of excitement from my perspective uh, in, in the years to come. Yes, some of it is. Um, I don't want to get into it too deeply um, because uh, we're still sort of working the numbers on that report, but within the report, we, we absolutely take that into account. And we have different models in the, in the economics report. Um, I don't know if everyone heard, I'm sorry. The, the question was, on the cost side, how much of that is, uh, is tax related or tax advantages or, or you know, similar type savings, right? Um, so it is taken into account, um, but the problem is it's very, uh, it's all over the map, literally, <laughs> um, on where, where it falls. So we had to make some generalizations, uh, but, but within the modeling we have, you know, traditional, we have some aggressive, uh, aggressive savings, uh, we have some, um, some, uh, some conservative savings, and then, uh, and then, and then fourth scenario, I don't, I don't remember the exact details of, but, but yes, we have, uh, we have a bunch of it. I don't go into it too deeply here. Um, happy to, to share it with you later. No, but on the subject of depreciation, uh, it is, so we talked to a lot of, a lot of different customers, a lot of diff end users, providers, and, 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 and the like. Um, and it's kind of hit or miss. Um, it depends on the locality, it depends on, uh, so, so one in particular customer was, was shooting for those types of, of depreciation, um, you know, claiming it as, as, uh, as personal property rather than, you know, real property uh, and realizing quicker, uh, uh, quicker depreciation there. In one area, um, it, was, uh, it was rejected, in another area, they're hopeful that they'll get it. So it just kind of depends on how, how savvy, um, I guess, how savvy the local authorities are. Um, but to reel that back a little bit, those claims, what we're finding is that they're a little bit overblown in that those who are, you know, do, do their due diligence and, and are savvy enough about their data center environments and all that uh, will, just because it's in, it's in a different box doesn't change the, the the useful life of that piece, right? So it may be advantageous now, but it's, we don't think it's gonna be long-term. It's kind of like a uh, take advantage of, of, of the confusion, <laughs> short-term, um, but it'll, it'll probably eventually be fixed. Answer your question? Sufficiently for now, anyway? Yeah. Okay. Um, so it, what I'm gonna get into here is um, from the economic side, uh, some considerations on, you know, uh, is prefab modular cheaper to buy? Um, reducing equipment needs via tighter integration, mass production implications, standardization again, somewhat, and then finally uh, commissioning and shipping costs. So when you have tighter integration of the equipment, and, and again, you can tailor your, uh, your, your IT environment, uh, or sorry, your support infrastructure to your IT environment, you can more closely align them. Um, Pieces of the tighter integration I have in the top here, examples, this is not an all-inclusive list, obviously, but you, know, you can right-size your, right your support equipment, integrate through controls and automation, um, airflow pattern optimization, that kind of thing. Some of this is, is done through uh, controls and, and um, intelligent equipment so, uh, software, but some of it is just uh, a, a byproduct of aligning the two environments. Um, and secondarily, you can, um, 
assuming you, you align them more closely, you don't have to build in as much headroom. So you can support a given amount of IT equipment with less infrastructure. Uh, so this, that, that's, whoops, sorry. that's one aspect of um, you know, consideration to take into account for, for pre fabricated modular. And I should just say that the, that the jury is still out on a lot of these considerations, um, and I'll get into some other considerations. There are, ad, there are advantages, there are disadvantages, but on the whole, uh, we see it as a, as a, positive, uh, a positive thing. Mass production and, uh, and moving, moving it into, uh, mo moving the production of the data center into a factory type environment, even if you maintained everything equal, when you mass produce, you realize advantages, right? So in a traditional sense, uh, you have, you're, you're, you're tied to using, in a lot of cases, local labor, subcontract, subcontractor coordination, rework costs, because as we know, the final product is never the same as what the initial uh, the initial goal is um, you're lucky if your as builts are real as builts. Um, on the prefab side, uh, you can sort of refine those aspects and uh, and you can build on locations with cheaper labor, in some cases more skilled labor. Uh, you can have on-site work and project management mi minimized, so it's more of a of an installation and startup than it is you know a construction project. And finally, you can get volume discounts for key pieces of equipment when you productize the data center and you can, uh, you, you can show um, you know, orders and, and you can essentially wholesale buy those pieces of equipment rather than single purchasing each one. And as a side note, um, on the downside to this, modules, when, when you're shrinking the size of your prefab pieces, you may sacrifice some, uh, some of the advantages of economies of scale. So as an example, you know, four 250 kW UPSs may be more expensive than one one megawatt UPS, right, on the upfront. Just, just an example, there are many others. Um, so, again, pros and cons to, to pretty much every point here. Standardization, uh, traditional data centers, individually designed, prefab, uh, you can amortize over many units. Um, and then you don't completely eliminate uh, individual site planning and preparation. There always has to be a backbone, so you don't eliminate that entirely, but you get rid of uh, a good portion of it and as much as you can with, uh, with prefabrication. On the commissioning and shipping cost front, you, w when you have prefabricated and, and pre-assembled in the factory, um, Colt, as an example, puts, you know, they, they take the order, they put it together in the factory, they pre-test, pre-commission everything, they, they take it apart in shipping splits, ship it to the customer, put it back together so it's essentially all uh, pre-commissioned, pre-tested, and then it's just uh, it's startup verification, more or less. Um, it's an oversimplification, of course, but that's, uh, the, that's kind of the, the, the ideal scenario. And then on the shipping front, this was kind of interesting. Um, the, 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 uh, the figure that, that they quoted was, um, I mean, it seems obvious that when you prepackage and you have, you know, the row on skids or if you have ISO containers, it's going to be uh, more, more uh, cost affordable to ship. Um, and then, yes, you, you reduce the possibility of shipping damage, but uh, I think Colt quoted roughly 40% savings on shipping uh, using their modular, uh, their, their modular approach, which was interesting. And this was for, uh, this was for Vern, so it was onto Iceland, so it, it, it took into account not just land transportation, but, but sea as well. So that was the, some of the points of, of cheaper to buy. Cheaper to run uh, from the OPEX side, um, oops, we have some considerations of uh, savings from the power bill, reducing staffing costs potentially, uh, maintenance costs, and finally um, efficient, uh, efficient deployment of capital and the time value of money. So for power bills, uh, again, the point I made earlier, you can support uh, a given amount of IT equipment with less power cooling equipment. So on, on the CapEx side, you're buying less equipment. On the OpEx side, you're operating closer to, uh, to your, your, your design, uh, your nominal um, rating of that equipment, and you realize uh, higher efficiency from, uh, from the right sizing. So for a given amount of IT, you bring your power bill down as a result. For staffing costs, 
Uh, a lot of this is centered around, as I mentioned before, as built matching the actual way that, uh, that the data center is built uh, and, and what I like to call new site gremlins. Um, you can't avoid them. I've never seen a situation where using the traditional uh, construction route that you totally avoid them. Um, the, the good folks will minimize them and make them very minimal and, and, uh, and, and not all that impactful, but they, they, they are still there. So when you have on-site customizations, you have differences between the, the as-built and, and, the, um, and the actual facility itself, uh, and there are real staffing costs and time sinks associated with dealing with those issues. Uh, in theory, prefab would, uh, would reduce them, uh, but with proper uh, and diligent commissioning, you can eliminate a lot of those with the traditional sense. Um, forgetting for a second the, the cost of the staffing right, associated with dealing with these issues, you have the, the potentially much larger financial implication, which is downtime as a result of these problems happening, right? This could, uh, could totally eclipse any of the costs associated with, um, with the staffing, and, and really it's kind of a, uh, it's, it's a uh, reducing or eliminating downtime as a result of, uh, of, of the facility not operating as it was designed or as the operations personnel think it actually does. So this needs to be evaluated on a case-by-case -case basis for modular builds. Uh, because it really is, is a thing that's essentially impossible to quantify. For maintenance costs, uh, argument for higher uh, maintenance costs, potentially anyway, just some, some considerations. Uh, restricted space work, dealing with more pieces of equipment, uh, contracts themselves could turn out to be more expensive, and then, uh, and then taking into account warranty. Um, when it's packaged together as a product, uh, the warranties, or at least uh, to, to, uh, to maintain the, the requirements of the warranty, uh, it could require that the maintenance itself be performed by the particular vendor or someone certified by the vendor. Um, and, and what I'm really saying here is that they make up the costs on the back end on the operational side that, that, that they may present on the front end. Counter argument to that, lower prices, um, you, you eliminate uh, the, the quote unquote not my job scenario. Uh, you have one throat to choke when you have one vendor supplier. And then, uh, and then there was a very large, um, very large contractor that has done modular, I can't say who they are, but ha that has done prefabricated modular as well as has a long history in, um, in traditional data center builds and on the maintenance costs on, on the, uh, with, with the modular approach, they're claiming 40% uh, savings there. I, um, I'm anxious to see and, and, and talk to the end user about that. Uh, I'm a little skeptical about that, but uh, I have no reason not to, to trust what they say because they have a, a long history of, of, of data centers. This kind of gets into, uh, well, no, it, do, it doesn't get into your specific question, but um, there's some other financial benefits on the uh, deployment of capital front. In the prefab, you can spend, expand as needed. Um, when you deploy everything up front, and this is an example, right? When you deploy everything day one, uh, the net present value of a $20, $25 million data center is $25 million on day one. When you deploy over time, and you take into account the time value of money, if you deploy the same capital in $5 million increments over four years, Assuming a 4% annual discount rate, uh, the net present value of, of that scenario ends up being around 23 million. So this is just a, a very brief glimpse at this. We get into it more um, in, in the economics report that we have, uh, but it is, it is a key consideration um, and, uh, and has you know, tangible results. It isn't limited to prefab. Uh, going a phased approach with the traditional build, uh, you can realize similar advantages. Some other considerations. Oops. Potentially, you can have a residual value of decommissioned modules. When you productize the data center, you almost get to a point where you, it's kind of like server resale, maybe. Uh, haven't yet seen it, because it's, very, it's a very uh, uh, immature market right now, but it is a consideration to take into account. It's really difficult to rip out a chiller, right, and resell that chiller. 
But when you have shipping splits and you have dis connection, disconnection points with the data center, there may be an opportunity to resell um, that, uh, that particular module, whatever it is. Um, get into the depreciation, depreciation times of equipment, personal property versus real property. Um, again, case by case type of, uh, of scenario. Um, permitting fees for, uh, for, the, for the personal property versus the construction project. The converse to that is you may be able to, uh, to skirt around some of the permitting fees, but you may end up having to deal more with AHJs Authorities having jurisdiction that don't know what this box is, um, and, uh, and and you may need to satisfy their requirements. Um, deploying on cheaper real estate, yes, it, it's a consideration. Most of the time, the cheaper real estate, you know, the the, the, the land and shell is roughly ten percent. So, in the grand scheme of things, it's not really all that. Uh, uh, it doesn't move the needle all that much. And then finally. Um, areas that have uh, aggressive or eliminated tax or VAT advantages um, are, are also potential uh, uh, savings areas. Um, if, for instance, the data center includes IT gear and it is then considered an IT piece of equipment, potentially if there's an area that has you know, tax exemption on IT equipment, it's kind of getting into loophole area, but you could avoid all, all taxes on that. Uh, haven't quite seen that yet, again, because the products and the market is very immature at the moment, but um, it's an area to look at, and if, if you get far enough in front of the curve, you may be able to realize those benefits. So some of the preliminary findings from our economics report. So this is, I, I really like this graph uh, because it shows, it compares your traditional uh, your traditional approach to the prefab modular. And this is, this is taken from our modeling. The numbers are taken out. Really, it's, it's qualitative um, or, or illustrative only. But what we have here is the four bars, um, as you see on the right. You've got the top quarter, the third, second, and the bottom quarter of the ranges of, uh, of capex, costs, capex costs on a uh, on dollar per watt of IT load. So in the traditional, you see you know, it's a very, very wide range. On the prefab modular, the range is much smaller, uh, but there is a significant amount of overlap. And you could conceivably, on the prefab, be in the middle area, right? And you could end up spending more than you would have in a traditional build. So the spread is less with, with prefabricated modular, uh, but the, uh, the median is lower. So this is, this is where we... Um, we say there's a potential for savings between 10 and 30 percent on, uh, on, on total ownership for prefabricated modular. Um, I realize that it's a contentious number and uh, there are a lot of qualifications involved in it. So um, it, it's a complex scenario, right? There's no, I can't tell you that if you build prefab modular, you're gonna save 25 percent. You may, you may not. Uh, but there, there are a lot of things to take into account. So this is also taken from the report, um, and, and this gives uh, TCO and, and spending per million um, for, for four different scenarios here. You have your upfront traditional bricks and mortar build. You have a phased approach, um, again, bricks and mortar. And then you have phased build prefabricated modular low savings, so conservative approach. And then finally, a, uh, a, an aggressive approach on, uh, on, on what the savings can be. So you see that there's not a whole lot of disparity uh, in the end between an upfront build um, and, a, uh, and, a, and a phased approach in the end. But uh, again, you get back to um, the time value of money and all of that. So clearly, taking a phased approach is, is the way to go, regardless of whether you do it bricks and mortar or you do it prefab modular. And then to the extent that, uh, that you can realize the advantages of some of the prefabricated pieces, yes, there is a case for, um, uh, for prefabrication saving you money, uh, but it isn't necessarily a given. Yes, sir? We assume 
uh, a certain cost for, for maintenance. Um, I don't remember what the figure is, but it is a, uh, we, we essentially break it down to um, dollar per KW for a person. Um, and we assume that as you scale up, um, I think it's, I don't remember the exact numbers, but, but each phase we end up adding more people, right? So, um, Yeah, I think the problem is we're, we're the scales sort of skew it a little bit. It, it, it does, if you were to project it out even further, it, it does diverge. Um, I realize it does look uh, somewhat parallel, but if you, look at, if you look at the beginning, well, yeah, so if you look at the green and the purple, the distance between, say, year six to year 15, it's, it's the same. But if you look at the, the difference between uh, the, the blue and the purple, at year six and year 15, you see that's diverging. Similarly, the red and the green uh, is diverging as time goes on as well. So um, what you're saying is that uh, with, with a phase build and traditional bricks and mortar versus phase build prefabricated modular, uh, we're, we're not, seeing, not, not seeing the OPEX savings is what you mean? Uh, that's a good question. Um, I'll have to get back to you on that. Oh, piece of paper. Don't let me forget. <laughs> I will get back to you on that. Uh, so to uh, to conclude and uh, and sort of summarize here, on the capex side, you have the potential for um, for, for prefabrication uh, saving between ten to thirty percent. Then, what we call mid-level traditional enterprise data center of thirteen dollars a watt. <laughs> Now, I realize that some people look at that and say, that's crazy talk. We can do it for much cheaper than that. Yes, we understand. Um, but we had to pick a reference point and go from there. Uh, and we have many scenarios in, in the research report that's really kind of beyond the, beyond the scope of this, as well as don't have a whole lot of time for it right now. But um, uh, that, that's where we put it. And we have aggressive and we have conservative uh, uh, modeling for, uh, for that. The really frustrating part of, of it for us, and it will extend to the market, those who are the vendors, as well as those who are the buyers, is that there is no consistency on price, price quoting. Um, you know, on what they include, what they don't include. Um, it's, it's just, we need to get <laughs> some type of, of, of standardized, um, you know, modular uh, terminology. And, and I realize that some of the onus is on us for that, which is why we're trying to define it. Um, but we're not going to be able to carry the load ourselves. Um, so the, the important thing there is that uh, you should always understand what it is you're selling, what it is your competitors are selling, what it is they're not selling, and as a buyer, what it is you're looking at buying. Um, don't assume that, uh, that a new IT business need immediately translates to we need a new data center. It may or may not. Going back to that, that first decision tree. Uh, something I didn't talk about, but I, I put it in here because I couldn't exactly figure out how to put it anywhere else in, in the presentation is that, that standardization, this kind of goes into the, 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 con the price consistency. The standardization is a chicken and egg situation. So what I mean by that is the vendors of the, 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 the early, um, you know, the, the flag carriers of of the vendor community in the prefabricated space. Uh, you have these products and they have an initial platform on which the final product is, is, uh, is based. But the problem is that every single one of their, uh, of their sales, of their projects, is, is customized to some extent. And the, the reason for that is that customers are like, well, you haven't built a whole lot of these, so since you're putting it together anyway, why don't we make these changes? And then internally, um, the engineers and all that are like, look, we need to decide on something. Uh, let's standardize on you know, five different things. But then they struggle for, well, what five different things do we, do we, do we, uh, do we decide on? Because not once have we had a, uh, a common need uh, from, from, a, from one of our customers, right? So it's a chicken and egg thing. I think what we need is we need someone charismatic with a black turtleneck saying, 
this is what you need. No, I, jo I joke. Um, it, just, it just works, right? Um, no, but I mean, th there's really some truth to that. We need to, there, there needs to be, the vendors themselves need to dig in and say, look, you know, we, we, you don't care so much about, about how it's put together. Really what you care about is operational, um, you know, how it operates, right? Performance characteristics rather than um, design nuances. And I think that that's, uh, that's the direction we're moving, um, which, which leads me to the last bullet here, and then I'll go back to, to DCM and autonomy here in a second, although it's really kind of a rehash of what I said earlier. But to the extent that we standardize the data center and we productize it, let's say we just productize it entirely, um, the, the area of operations and, and how the data center is maintained and operated becomes more and more important. Um, and the problem is that, uh, and going to the DC, DCIM and autonomy and, uh, and intelligence automation built into the data center, you then have a data center that is, you know, there, there's communications and, uh, and really kind of automatic operation bringing IT and the facility infrastructure together. I mean, it's, it's, we're not quite there, but we're starting to see, for instance, Schneider Electric and, and other uh, infrastructure equipment vendors interfacing with the hypervisor, right? And you, you have APIs and what have you that are starting to um, initiate or at least uh, inform of it might be a good idea to start um, virtual machine migration. And that's very exciting because for the, for the mainstream market, for, for traditional end users, they can start to realize benefits that you know, the, the bleeding edge content providers could have in the past like Google or you know, Yahoo or, or even eBay or, or whatever. Um, so it's kind of a trickle down thing. Um, but when you have a complex environment like that and you have a, a, a autonomy involved in, in the way that it actually operates, some will argue that operationally you need dumber people or I should say you don't need people who are as smart. Um, but I say that's actually entirely incorrect. From a day-to-day -day standpoint, yeah, it may be more hands-off. Um, it, it may be just kind of, 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 of watching everything purr and hum, right? The problem is that when something breaks, and I say when, not if, when something breaks, you have a much more complex environment and you need your people to, to understand the bigger picture, not siloed in, the, in their particular area. They need to understand you know, how the autonomy works how this system interfaces with this system. So you need people who are very, um, who, who have very refined troubleshooting and big picture understanding of the entire system, not just singular systems. So you think it's difficult to find people now, it's only gonna get harder that, uh, that operate them together. Um, and I talked enough about DSIM. So just uh, formalizing the two, kind of bulletizing I should say, the two reports that, that we have coming out um, around uh, prefabricated modular. We have uh, what, what most of this material, or at least the economics material, was taken from the, the economics of data sim 2.0. Uh, we talk about potential savings from modular designs, uh, several model scenarios, comparative analysis uh, on a year by year basis and cumulative, taking into account all of the, uh, all of the you know, staffing costs and land and and many different considerations for what the costs are and breaking that out. And then we do a comparative analysis of it. The market monitor and uh, market sizing, essentially, is what this report is. It, it's, it uh, gives market sizing scope and a picture of, of what the market is and um, gives uh, aggregate modular data center revenues. Uh, we're not, we're not uh, giving tables of vendor X is Y million in revenue of modular. We're not, it was hard enough to get them to share the information as it is. Um, uh, so we're, we're, right now we're giving aggregate, but it is, it is still very applicable to the, to the industry and it's, uh, it's, it's really, it was somewhat eye-opening when we actually got into the numbers. Um, talking about deployments in that report, so some, some various deployments of you know, real, real world scenarios of those different products. Revenues by deployment types, whether it's, um, you know, containerized data center or modular um, uh, components and systems or, you know, comprehensive modular data centers, uh, the, the, the three, different, three different buckets. And, uh, and finally, talking about 
accelerators, accelerators and inhibitors to the market, um, to, to the prefabricated modular data center market. Yes, sir? Uh, both of these reports should be out within the next month. I expect it to be sooner than that, but I want to be safe and say a month. So that concludes my presentation. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Right, so preliminary expectations is right around half a billion for 2011. So it's, it's, I won't say conclusively that's it, but it's, that's about where we expect it to come in. The question was wh what was the market size expectation right now? Yes, Jeff? The growth rate of what? Um, well, we do, we, we will have, you're talking about, the question was, what about the growth rate for the market? You're talking about the, uh, associated with the market sizing effort. We do give, uh, or rather, we will give expectations for, um, you know, for the out years, you know, what we expect. Uh, I think we project out at least four, uh, but right now it's too early to say what those projections are. I'm still working on the modeling on that. Waiting for some, some other folks to come back with, uh, with data. Other questions? Yes, sir. So you mean, how do we take into account whether the whether you're dealing with industry, like a greenfield versus brownfield, or no, uh, or common areas? Of, oh, right. 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 Okay. So the question is, if, if if I'm understanding it correctly, because the vendors report their products in various different ways. Some include some things, some include, don't include other things. As an example, have the building, don't have the building, have the land, don't have the land, that kind of thing. Uh, yes, it's, it's a good question, and uh, how I get through it, if I had hair, I'd be pull pulling my hair out. But um, it, it, it's frustrating, but we do normalize.